What I have taken as the uh, theme for this is essentially that innovation is things that happen in our heads rather than innovation being ha things that happen in laboratories, which I was very glad to find that Dr. Sato took the, took the same view, that this innovation is really about innovation. What I'm going to be talking about is, first of all, looking a little bit at strengths and weaknesses in Irish healthcare and what needs to change and coping with the crisis. And I'm sorry I've said don't waste a good recession because that's already been said earlier, but I'm going to say it again and several times and talk a little bit about access and entitlement and the failures in the boom times and the partial successes in the recession, and uh, looking at pr the problem of reform and the problem of change. And I will be perhaps coming, to, for some of you, to the slightly strange conclusion that we've got to be very careful not to do too much changing. And uh, finally, looking at sort of a solid basis for trying to improve access and effectiveness. So, uh, what are the strengths of the Irish health system as it stands at the moment? Well, access is reasonably good for acute uh, problems. Um, it's a reasonable safety net for people on very low incomes uh, for access to primary care and pretty good access to secondary care for people on low incomes as well. And the problems, in my view, are mainly around function more than about structure. And if you look at the uh, history of the last 15 years, we've restructured on many times, many times, and we've done almost nothing to change function. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that in a moment. There are financial barriers to primary care which produce interestingly perverse incentives. For many people, it's cheaper to get their treatment in a place where it's more expensive to provide it. And that, on the whole, is not a clever way of organizing things to encourage people to do high-cost things because it's low price to them. There are problems of access to non-emergency care. That's to say there is often quite long delays in getting access to elective treatment, however important it is. And as usual, the urgent tends to displace the important. And that's a very common characteristic around healthcare systems. And there's, uh, at times, poor access to uh, emergency care where the hospitals get full of people who are medically discharged and no longer need to be there, but there is nowhere else for them to go. I'm the vice chairman of St. James's Hospital, the finest hospital in Dublin and best managed by some margin. And uh, that's what I say anyway. And uh, we have at the moment about 130 patients there who have been medically discharged, but who we can't move on because there's nowhere suitable for them to go. And you can see how if you're using more than 10% of your capacity for a job that's not yours, it's, it's typically difficult to manage. There's poorly developed uh, community health services uh, with curious patterns of entitlement to them, and again, that often encourages people to be seeking care in the wrong locations, and uh, we get in many of the problems you would expect. So what would I argue needs to change? Well, I think we need low or no barriers to access, financial barriers to access for primary and community services. At the moment, for most people, access to primary care will cost you 45 to 55 euro per time. But more importantly, there are many services to which you have no entitlement, even if you're willing to pay. If I want to get physiotherapy services, if I can find a private physiotherapist, that's fine. But if I can't, Technically, I have no entitlement to the state-provided service, even if I need it badly, and even if it would prevent me from going into hospital. We need to shift chronic care from hospital to shared care models, looking at where we can most appropriately provide services at the lowest cost and the greatest convenience for, for where people live. And we need to reconfigure the incentives, both for users and for providers, so that we don't get the perversity that often is there that encourages people to provide care in the, in the wrong locations and often in the wrong ways. Just as a small snippet on that, seeing as we have uh, uh, the, the regulator with us here, I've always been impressed with a nice little statistic that... Uh, there is a strong incentive, uh, if you have private insurance, to have a private delivery. Um, that's only, so obviously only if you're pregnant is there an incentive to have a private delivery. And uh, 
If you look at the caesarean section rate for elective private deliveries, it's more than twice the rate you get if you're a, a public patient, suggesting that the incentives not only produce perverse incentives to users, but also perverse incentive to providers, the way that, the way that they're currently structured. So I want to talk a little bit about coping with the crisis or how to make best use of the crisis. And it may be a slightly odd thing to be saying, but the crisis has given opportunities, I think, to make quite a lot of quite important changes, some of which I think can be consolidated and, and will be long-term improvements. We've seen considerable increases in flexibility and innovation in the way that services are provided and an acceleration of some of the change in, in this detail of how, how we do the business. There are some uh, obvious examples of this, a much more rapid shift towards short stays in hospital and daycare procedures where previously more expensive models were there. And we've seen some reductions in the costs of care towards more comparable countries Ireland did previously have a reputation for being able to do the same thing at a significantly higher cost than, than other comparable countries were doing at the same time. So the early experience of the recession was doing more for less. The later experience seems to be of doing less for less. So it's been interesting to look at the progression here. Initially, there was sufficient slack in the system that the response to the pressure was that we got the same quality and, in some cases, enhanced quality, same quantity, in some cases, greater quantity of service without additional resources being put in there. But as we've got further into the recession, there's beginning to be signs that the system is no longer able to develop easily those additional um, efficiencies, and we're seeing worsening access in some cases. And... Uh, there's been some limited and I think rather superficial progress in managing emergency care and, uh, a and access to important elective care. And I think there's a lesson in how this was done. This was done largely by having special schemes and, and teams running around telling people how to do the job better. And as soon as they stop running around, people stop doing the job better. There's a very good uh, literature available on managing change and it would suggest you do exactly the opposite of what has been done, which was very much not embedding the change in the underlying culture of the organisations providing care. But just a little bit of evidence around the doing more for less. Uh, it's an interesting story here that this is the public entitlements to free GP care, the so-called medical card scheme. You can see how it's right, risen very rapidly in terms of the population covered. If you look at what's happening to the population, that's in green. Now, it has been rising steadily through this period, and although budgets have not been going up, the biggest pressure has not been the ageing of the population, it's been the growth of the population. If you look at the um, staffing levels, that's the blue line with, the, with the, the diamonds on it, that is showing that the staffing total in the system has gone down, and that's a large reason for, for the budgets going down. If you look at the public budgets, They've been uh, following those red squares. I want to make one little point about that. You can see the projection for 2014 was for a further reduction in the budget, and that was what was announced. Today's been a little unusual for me because it's the first day since Monday that I haven't bumped into the minister at a meeting. I'm not just trying to do my sort of how important I am, but obviously I am if I meet him three times in three days. But... Um, he has said on each occasion the same thing. He said, the budget has not gone down. Sorry, the funding has not gone down. The budget's gone down, but the funding hasn't because they've overspent the budget by the amount that it was meant to be reduced. And uh, he was almost proudly saying, look, we haven't cut the budget. We've tried to, but we failed. And uh, it's quite interesting sort of take on this. They've been the good guys because they've failed to do the bad things that they wanted to do. But... Um, what you've seen there is the budget being initially reduced and then stabilised in terms of the actual expenditure with significant increased pressures, as you can see from the, from the other parts of that. And uh, in terms of uh, cases and how we do the business, you can see day cases have risen really very dramatically over this period. And uh, in general, inpatient activity has stayed pretty stable and uh, emergency 
uh, admissions have gone up. So there's been a lot of pressure in the system and there's been some increase in, in volume and, and, and quantities of care uh, at the same time as the, the resources being, being very fixed. And if you want to know, are we killing people any more than we used to? No, we're killing them quite a lot less. People are living longer. Um, this tr there's been a long-term trend in improved death rates, but that has been largely maintained, although there may be some slight evidence that in, in the last couple of years things have begun to, to, to become less satisfactory there. But I think there is a nice story here, and this is uh, since the development of a much more serious cancer program, and this again is not new bits of equipment, it's new, not new ideas on how to treat cancers, this is better organization of care in a focused way to try and improve cancer care, you can see that there has been a very significant improvement in, in cancer survival o over this period, and that has been maintained. And I put in specifically the, uh, uh, the National Cancer Control Program came in in 2007, and uh, unfortunately the um, slightly complicated to read it on that chart, but you can see that there's been a major improvement in cancer outcomes, and it seems to be associated with better organization of care, using the same techniques and technology, but doing the job in a more organized and effective way. So a little bit about access and entitlement. Well, in the boom years, we had every opportunity to sort out historical problems in entitlements and, and how we organize access to care, and nothing happened. Of almost nothing happened. Since then, there's been, uh, there was a huge increase in the public health budget, but despite that, there was very little improvement in, in the uh, entitlements that people had. And indeed, people over 70 were given for a brief period um, free access to primary care, and then that entitlement was removed in, in the early times of the recession. But it's about to be given back in a slightly different form. Um, because it saved almost no money, it caused a whole lot of additional administration, and it made the whole system more incoherent than it would otherwise have been. But we've seen numbers getting free access to care rapidly rising, and I think this is particularly important because it's much easier to do further improvements in access if you've already got a higher proportion already covered. And I think that's one reason why we're seeing plans for people under six and people over 70 all to get free access to GP care coming through in, within the next couple of years. And that's, to say, is a little bit easier to achieve because we're already much further up the curve. But in the background in all of this, and I think this is, there's a huge warning here, there's been over the last 15 years a total addiction to reform. Every time there's a problem, we must reform the system. And people have become complete reform junkies. You cannot imagine sitting there and saying, let's try and make this system better. You have to say, let's reorganize the system and make it different. And there's very little understanding of the costs and the loss of efficiency caused by this kind of change. There's quite a good body of evidence, and I've only written about uh, half of the papers that are responsible for this. No, that's about, perhaps it's a quarter. Um, there's a good body of evidence that uh, major change takes three to five years to recover from. So if you have a major change every five years, you can guarantee you will never get improvement in the service because you're constantly recovering from the previous change. Any of us who have worked in the delivery of care, indeed anyone who's worked in a university knows every time they reorganize it, it takes th three to five years to get over that reorganization and get the new structures to work properly. And uh, there's good evidence that serious improvement requires a period of stability if we're to hope to improve access to care. So what would I see as a sort of solid basis for improving access and, and ef effectiveness? Well, we've shown we can make the system become uh, more efficient by small and painstaking and careful improvements in, in, in the way that we organize ourselves and the way we do our business. But uh, there are some particular directions we need to move in. One of them is recognizing that overwhelmingly the work of the healthcare system is managing chronic disease. And uh, probably be around 65 to 80 percent, depending on how you calculate it, of healthcare activity is for pre existing chronic problems that are, people are having managed rather than cured. 
we still have in our heads the notion that we have an episodic problem where somebody comes with a problem, you solve it and send them away. If someone has a continuing problem and you keep sending them away, they keep coming back. It's not a very complicated problem to understand. It's a much more complicated problem to work out what you do about it. But we really need to mo make much more rapid strides to organize the delivery of care in ways that recognize this continuing, persistent, chronic nature. On the other hand, if we do that, we may well be able to provide a lot of the services at very substantially lower cost than we do at the moment, thereby being able to accommodate some of the population growth that we've just been, uh, been described at, which is going to be hitting Ireland later than it hits Japan, but it'll be hitting just as hard when it comes round because the population is ageing very rapidly here, albeit from a very low base. And there are one or two things, I think, that are quite interesting to look at in this context. For example, the men are catching up. Men are now living longer, more than women are living longer. M women's life expectancy in, in this part of the world is increasing only at about uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 years per decade, while men's is increasing by about 1.4, 1.5 years per decade. So every decade, we're catching up by nearly a year in life expectancy, which is great news for all of us, not only for men, but also for women, because the proportion of single-person households is now beginning to decline. Even though the absolute numbers is high and is rising, the proportion is declining. We've got good evidence that shows that as the proportion of two-person or more households increases, then uh, the healthcare costs rise at a slower rate. And when you think about it, it's not surprising because a household needs one brain and one body. It can be in the same person or it can be spread between the two. But if you look one of each of those things, you can survive reasonably well. As soon as you take away one or other of those capacities, then the system breaks down and you find people requiring institutional care. So I think we can be optimistic that with a combination of better management of the problems that are coming up and some relief that is coming from the uh, changing demography, being useful as well as the changing demography being a challenge, we may well be able to cope quite well with, with some of the uh, challenges that come. So a few concluding thoughts. We think of innovation often as techniques and materials, but I think innovation is more than anything else about ideas and process. It's about just getting into your heads you can do things better if you're given a bit of a chance to organize yourselves in better ways. The stress on the system, I think, has done some good and has removed some pointless constraints, but too much stress cannot be coped with without harm. And when we look at how much do you push the system, the answer is quite a lot, but not too much. And I think we've got some very good experience in the Irish experience in the last three or four years that a certain amount of pushing is helpful. and Beyond that, the pushing is entirely unhelpful. And we've got to manage, I think, our ways around that. And uh, too much change has made change difficult. And I think if we can remember nothing else, in order to get radical change, you probably have to have a pretty stable basis to get that. So if you have been listening, thanks for your attention. <laughs>